This morning we read responsively from the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel. We read from the first verse down through the 14th verse. That is again, we read from the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel where we read from the first verse down through the 14th verse, a passage of scripture where the disciples, they asked a rather odd question. We will see there in the opening verse of this chapter where the disciples, we read and we saw how they asked Jesus, who then is the greatest? in the kingdom of heaven. As I said, it's a rather odd question to me because why can't you just be in heaven? Why do you have to desire to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's a question that sounds like an ambition that is worldly, doesn't it? So we'll see here in this passage of scripture today where Jesus, he had to, to teach the disciples a very important lesson, a lesson that all of us that we have to learn today as well. And I think that we have been taking a look at this, this lesson throughout the year as well. We'll see there an example there in the second verse that Jesus, he taught the lesson by calling forth a child that he set in the midst of he and the disciples there. And if all of us are looking at that scripture, we'll see my key verses for today will be the third and the fourth verse. That is again, the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel, the third and the fourth verse, those verses, they serve as my key verses for today. If we have that, let us say, amen. amen. If you need a moment, just say, I need a moment. We'll see there in the third verse that the scripture, it reads, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as what? You will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said to the disciples there. And then there in the fourth verse, we'll see that Jesus, he then said, whoever humbles himself as this little what? is the what we're at. Amen. So again, Jesus, he said there in that fourth verse, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The disciples, they wanted to know who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus, he brought forth a child. Now, from those two verses for today, I want to focus on, I want to talk about today for a thought to be great. Again, my thought for today is to be great. Now, could you imagine the disciples' faces when they had asked Jesus that question in the second verse about, well, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Could you imagine their faces when Jesus, he called for a child to come to him. And when the child came to him, he sat the child there in the midst with himself and the disciples. Could you imagine their faces when Jesus essentially said, this child represents who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see the disciples, they, they struggled with, a certain ambition. They struggle with an ambition that many people in the world today struggle with as well. They struggle with putting their worldly ambitions in check. And these again were Jesus's closest followers. The struggle that was apparent with their worldly ambitions is seen a couple of chapters later in the 20th chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 20th through the 22nd verse where James and his brother, John, 
they desired to be at the hands of Christ in heaven, one at the left and one at the right hand of Christ, which again, it speaks to not simply being happy with being in heaven. It speaks to them having this need, having this desire, having this ambition to be the greatest, in the kingdom of heaven, this, this worldly ambition of power, power being higher than others. Does that sound like an ambition? Does that sound like something that someone should desire for going to heaven? doesn't sound like a desire that, that anybody should have. When it comes to heaven, you should just want to go. You should just want, want to be there. Thank you, Brother Harry. So the disciples, I, I would say to you all today that they failed to realize how such an ambition, it was hindering them from understanding what Jesus had been teaching them all along. For example, if you take a look at the 19th chapter of Matthew's gospel, I'm going to reference the 10th chapter of Mark's gospel. In a passage of scripture, after Jesus had finished counseling the rich young ruler, who, by the way, was also hindered by the same worldly ambition. And Jesus said to the disciples in the 10th chapter of Mark's gospel and in the 23rd verse, he said to them, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And then in the 25th verse in the 10th chapter of Mars gospel, Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, when Jesus said that to the disciples, scripture tells us that the disciples, they looked at Jesus astonished. They, they looked at Jesus astonished and then they asked Jesus a question. Well, who then can be saved? You see, they asked this question because in their minds, the rich, they should be easily saved because in their minds, someone like the rich young ruler, because the rich young ruler had many possessions because the rich young ruler had great wealth. We would say today, surely the, the rich young ruler must be blessed by God. That's how many people think today, isn't it? You know, we, many people today, they believe that you're blessed and, and highly favored by what you have, by what you own, by, by what you possess. Because you see, in the world, what you have, what you own, what you possess, your wealth, it determines your greatness. And so in their minds, if you are great in the world, then surely you will be great in heaven as well, which is ironic because the disciples, they didn't have much, which I guess is why they asked the question, which is why I guess they were so concerned about being the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, because here they were closely following Jesus. They were fishermen. They were poor in the world. And so they didn't want to be poor anymore when they got to heaven. They desire to be over everyone because they closely followed Jesus. And so again, their thoughts was, Hey, if a man of the stature of the rich man, if that man can't be saved, that man is not going to be in heaven. Well, who then can be saved? They asked, do you see how easily we are fooled by worldly ambition? Do you see how easy it is for the world to confuse anyone, even yourself, about who it is that is great and who it is that is blessed? 
Paul, he said to the Corinthians that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. Paul said that God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Jesus, when the disciples asked, well, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus, he brought forth a child to stand before them. He brought forth the child to stand before them to show true greatness. Do you understand today that children, they are special to the Lord? Children, they are special to the Lord in that they aren't hindered by the world. Children are special to God because what is on their mind is not necessarily gaining all of the riches of this world. The disciples, they were hindered by that ambition. They were hindered by that ambition. And what Jesus was doing here in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel is he was training them out of that worldly ambition. He had to take the, the teachings of the world. He had to take those teachings out of their mind. He had to take those teachings out of their hearts so that they truly could be great. And for an example there in the 10th chapter of Matthew's gospel and in the 13th verse, if you're still in the 19th chapter of Matthew's gospel, you can look at the 13th verse. There was an occasion just prior to Jesus counseling the rich young ruler there where people, they were trying to bring their children to Jesus so that Jesus could touch their child so that he could pray so that he could bless their children. But there the disciples were. They were there preventing the people from bringing their children to, to Christ. Again, children are special to the Lord, and there the disciples were trying to hinder the child, children, from being brought to Christ. And over in, in Mark's gospel, Scripture tells us that Jesus, he was greatly displeased by their actions. And in the 14th verse there, Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is made up of such, the children. And so because children are so special to God, many of us, we may begin to, to wonder well, do I need to revert back to being childish? In other words, some of us may, may begin to wonder, do I need to go back to acting like I did when I was a child? Now, to answer this question, I want to call to your remembrance Nicodemus. In the third chapter of John's gospel, Jesus, he taught Nicodemus that in order for one to inherit the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said that one must be born again. Now, when, when Jesus taught Nicodemus this, Nicodemus, he was confused. And I imagine that he had the same astonished look on his face that the disciples had when, when Jesus brought forth a child and said, this child represents those who are greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And in this confusion, Nicodemus, he asked Jesus that, that did this mean that, that he needed and that others needed to enter a second time into their mother's womb and to be born, to literally be born in the world, in the flesh, a second time? And you can imagine that Jesus, he, he brushed, he weighed that one off because that was a silly question. But as my dad said, when you ask Jesus a question, there ain't no such thing as a silly question. Jesus, he, he responded to Nicodemus by saying, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
And Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Jesus, he taught Nicodemus that one must be born again spiritually in order to inherit the heavenly kingdom. To the disciples, Jesus, he brought forth a child and said that the child represents those who are greatest in the kingdom of heaven. To the disciples, when they were hindering the children from coming to Jesus, Jesus said, hey, don't do that. Don't forbid them because of such is the kingdom of heaven. And, and we wonder today, do we need to revert back to being a child? Jesus said, no, you need to be born again in the spirit. You see, when one is born again through the spirit, they become little children in the spirit. We become like little children once again. And essentially, when we are born again, we get another opportunity. We get a second chance. And, and I don't know about all of you, but if I mess up the first time around and you give me another opportunity, you give me a second chance. I ain't messing up again. If it's, if it's in baseball, if I were to relate this to baseball, if I strike out the first time around, but you give me a second chance and you let me know what is coming as God has did for us, I ain't striking out the next time around. How many of you live with that mindset today? You see, greatness is taking advantage of that second chance. God has given all of us a second chance through his only begotten son who has rebuked us of our wrongdoing. God has given us another opportunity to be great. But how many of us are taking advantage of the opportunity that God has given to us to be great? Or how many of us are moving out of insanity today? Where we have been given the second chance to be great, but we continue to do what holds us back. In other words, we continue to indulge in we continue to live in sin and we think that we are going to be great. The Lord does not desire for any of us to be hindered by such a mindset that will not allow us to be great. You see, I want you to understand something today that you may have never understood. God desires, God wants for you to be great. Why else does the Lord continue to watch over you? Why else does the Lord continue to keep you in his care? Why else does the Lord continue to pour out his love onto you? God, I want you to understand today, he does not want you to be hindered. He does not want you to be tethered to this world. The Lord desires, the Lord wants for you to be in his heavenly kingdom. God wants you to be great. But how many of us desire that same thing? How many of us want to be great today? So in order for us to be great, God, he again set forth a child before us today to show us the example that we are to follow in in order to attain greatness. That child being Christ himself. Oh, it's the holiday season, ain't it? Y'all didn't see where I was going with that the whole time. A child is in the midst of us this season as a representative 
of greatness in the kingdom of heaven. But how many of us will follow that child in order to be great? In order for us to, to be great, God, he desires for all of us today to move with the spirit of a child in the newness of the spiritual life that we have been born into because of the child that he gave to the world. Now, some of us, we may begin to wonder, well, what is this spirit of a child that, that I am supposed to move in? Because pastor, you said five, six minutes ago that I'm not supposed to act childish. I don't want you acting childish. We ought to know what the spirit of a child is. Weren't we children before? So think about it for a moment. What were you like? What was your spirit like as a child? See, I, I don't know about you, but when I was a child, I was free thinking. I had a great imagination. You can just ask my brother about that. I could take toy cars and make them into a living world. They was baseball players. They was football players. They was basketball players. They were the greatest athletes ever. And they was just toy cars. I even made them wrestlers as well. When, 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 when I was a little boy, everything imaginable was possible. There was no such thing as impossible. When I was told that, that I couldn't do something, I, I asked the uh, famous question that, that children would ask. I would say, well, why not? Why can't I? You no know, children. Children are like that. That's, that's the spirit that, that children have. They, they are remarkable in their innocence of, of not knowing. The, the, the spirit of a child, it doesn't know bitterness. It does not know hatred. It does not know wrath. It's not selfish. It's, it's not greedy. It's not filled with worldly ambitions until somebody comes along and say, hey, yeah, you know, you, you should be this way or you should be that way. You, you, you get two children and you sit them in a room and you give one a happy meal, but don't give the other a happy meal. Watch that child break off a piece and give it to the other child that didn't have. Children, they can go on the playground and, and they can play together regardless of, of gender. Doesn't matter if it's boy or girl. Doesn't matter race at all. They will play together with one goal in mind. To be happy and to have fun. To me, that way, the imagination and, and the hope that, that children have in their spirit today, it is one of the most beautiful things it is in the world. Children, they truly do believe that, that anything is possible. But then look at what happened to us. I remember being little and I got tired of being told, well, you can't do such and such until you're bigger, until you grow up some. And so like every other child, I, I would try to rush to grow up. I believe all of us was there at some point. And my dad, I can still hear his voice telling this to me. My dad, he told me when I was busy trying to rush and grow up, he said, don't you be in a hurry to grow up. How many of us heard that one before? My dad said that this moment you, you should cherish because one day you're going to miss it. And boy, do I miss having that innocent spirit. Boy, do I, do I miss not being so hindered down and barred down. Many of us, we, we, we live our lives and we look back on those days and, and gone are those days. Gone are those days when we weren't afraid to ask a billion questions like little children do now. 
children, they'll ask a billion questions. They, they, aren't, they aren't that stubborn. They have a sense of humility. When they don't know something, they'll ask a billion questions because they want to know. I was that child. Just ask my mom. Gone are those days where, where we could move around and we didn't care whether we was playing with a boy or a girl. We didn't care about, about race. We weren't hindered down in, in bitterness. We weren't hindered down in, in wrath. Gone are those days of dreams and, and imagination where everything seemed possible to us. Truly, the saddest part about having grown up is, is all of that being torn and ripped away from us by, by life and, and by the world itself. And all we are left with is a shell of that spirit that we once had. All that is left now is, is sadness, depression. Living a life where many of us are living miserably because we desire to be great in the world. And, and, and being great in the world means that you must have more than the next person. We argue about it all the time in sports. The greatest football player is the one that has the most Super Bowls. The greatest basketball player is the one that won the most championships. The same is true in baseball. Outside of sports, we have the same thing going on. You know, the greatest actor is the one that acted in the best movies, the most movies, right? The, the, the greatest singer is the one that won the most wars. The greatest person walking around in the world today is the one that has the most riches, the one that has the biggest bank account. Not the one that goes home every day to their, their family and loves their family. Uh-oh. To be great and worldly ambitions, they don't mix when it comes to the Lord. Again, Jesus brought forth a child before the disciples and their eyes was like this. Huh? You see we again must consider what it is that get applauded today for greatness and what it is that Jesus said is greatness. God does not again desire for anyone to live with such ambition. This is why God commanded Israel to not move with such ambition, which is filled with covetousness, which is filled with lust. In the 12th chapter of Luke's gospel and in the 15th verse, to a crowd that was gathered to him, Jesus, he taught them, and therefore he taught all of us as well, to take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Jesus, he said to the crowd that it is better to be rich toward God than lay up treasure for yourself. And so I ask all of you today, do you desire to be great? Some of us, we may shake our head no. But I would actually say to you today that you actually should live with a desire to be great. You should live with a desire to be great, not by worldly ambition, however. You see, God, again, he desires for you to be great. And so if God desires for you to be great, there's nothing wrong with being great. But we should live in the manner that God has ascribed to us to live in if we desire to be truly great. That is, we ought to live by the word of God. Now, if you pay close attention there in the second and in the third verse there, in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel, when Jesus called on the child to come to him, you notice that the child simply went to Jesus. There was no objections. The child didn't hesitate. The child did not question it. How many of us today are moving towards the Lord? How many of us today are moving towards Christ 
in that same manner. Without objection and, and without hesitance, without, without questioning the Lord. You see, Jesus has, has called all of us to come unto him. But sadly, again, many of us, we question Christ. Sadly, many of us, we, we object to Christ. Sadly, many of us, we are hesitant to go to Christ. And the reason why that is, is because we are hindered by our worldly ambitions. We, we think to ourselves, well, what God desires for me, it ain't the best. I, 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 I know what is best for me. You've heard me say that one before. And so many of us, we end up blocking ourselves from truly being great. We end up blocking ourselves from our blessings. And again, what it is that is blocking us is, again, those worldly ambitions. We aren't satisfied with Jesus' offer because Jesus' riches, they, they aren't the world's riches, as I said to you all a few weeks ago as well. Jesus is offering to us again is that of a future peace and hope, a desire for us to be great in that manner. That is what we should ascribe for and to. Many of us, we, we give up hope. We give up on hope and we give up on salvation because we can't see the hope and we can't see the salvation. We, we cannot see the greatness that the Lord has offered for us. Many of us, we have to see hope. We have to see salvation in order for us to desire it, in order for us to want to go and have it. But in the eighth chapter of Romans and the 24th verse, Paul, he wondered for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen, Paul said, that's not hope. Paul said, for why does one still hope for what he sees? As we know, faith, that is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so to attain true greatness, Paul wrote that one must not walk by sight, but walk by faith. So that is a statement that is very similar to what Jesus said and is recorded in the fourth chapter of John's gospel and the 23rd verse where Jesus, he stated the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father. Jesus said is seeking a such to worship him. Jesus, he then added on in the 24th verse in the fourth chapter of John's gospel, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. See, the father is seeking true worshipers today. And the reason why the Lord is seeking true worshipers today is because he desired to bless the true worshipers with true greatness to be great. You see, the Lord, he, he desires those who are of true faith. He desires them to be great in his eyes, not in the world's eyes. Again, I say to you today, I don't care what the world has to say when it comes to being blessed, when it comes to be great, because the world does not know the first thing about being blessed and about being great. God does. So again, who is it that is greatest in the heavenly kingdom? And Jesus, he said there in the second of my key verses there in the fourth verse, Jesus said, whoever humbles himself as this little child, have you humbled yourself to, to having the spirit of a child? Jesus said, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So if you desire, if your desire is truly greatness, 
the greatness that, that God desires for all of us. The Lord, again, I say to you today, he wants you to be blessed. And, and if you desire it, Jesus, he has some, some words for us. He has some words for the disciples because again, he has to train us out of the world's mindset. He has to train us to out of that, that worldly ambition. And we'll see the training begin there in the eighth verse. We're there in the eighth verse. Jesus, he taught us that if our hand or foot hinders us in the desire to be great, in the desire to be blessed, Jesus said that we should cut them off and that we should cast them from us. Then there in the ninth verse, Jesus, he again, he said to the disciples there again, saying to us there, if we truly desire to be blessed, if we truly desire to be great, Jesus said that if our eyes hinder us from being blessed, If our eyes hinder us from being great in God's eyes, Jesus said that we should pluck them out and that we should cast them away from us. Do you see what it is that Jesus said there? Now, I want to be very clear here because I don't want my literal thinkers here to be confused on this statement. Because there in the eighth and the ninth verse, Jesus, he was speaking figuratively, not literally. Jesus was not telling you to go out and to mutilate yourself. I I, I just, I feel I need to be very plain and clear about that because I don't want nobody to be going out there plucking out their eyes and saying, hey, Pastor McCrary told me that I need to pluck out my eyes because I looked at that woman the wrong way. I didn't say that. Jesus didn't say that as well. Jesus, he was speaking figuratively there. And and, and what Jesus is saying there, in essence, combined on to the fact that we need to be born again. Jesus is saying there that when we are born again, when we are that, that child in the spirit, that we need to cast away those sinful hindrances. Do you hear me here? If you desire to be blessed, if you desire to be great, you need to cast away any attachments to you, whether it is thing or person. You need to cast away those attachments that hinders you from being great. But but so many of us, we hold on to, to those hindrances in our walk. hoping that that those things and those people will will get better when they don't get better. We we hold on to to what hinders us from moving in faith, from being obedient to the word of God. We hold on to those that say you can't be great. I don't know about you, but I don't need nobody in my life that's going to tell me I can't be great. You see, I'm born again and and I'm like that little child again in that I have that spirit of a child again. And so my imagination can run wild. I'm opened up to the Lord and I have received his word. And so I believe that all things are possible to me. And so I don't need somebody in my life that's going to hinder me and say, oh, no, that ain't possible, pastor. No, you can get out of my life. I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to pluck you out and I'm going to cast you away from me because I desire to be great in the kingdom of heaven. The Lord, I want you to understand today desires for those that have the desire to inherit his kingdom He desires for them to cast away the sinful hindrances because sin will not be allowed in heaven. The Lord today, 
He desires for you to have that spirit of wonder. He desires for you to have that spirit of humility. He desires for you to have that spirit of curiosity, of love, of joy, of hope. So many of us, we have lost hope today. He desires for you to have that spirit again of love. So many of us, we have gone cold in our hearts today. You see, the realist that is driven by the mindset of the world and driven by worldly ambition, Jesus has said they won't have a part in God's kingdom because that which is of the flesh will not inherit the heavenly kingdom. Do you desire to be great today? Do you desire the heavenly kingdom today? Again, I call on us to be great today. I say to you today, let us be great is what I say to you today. We'll see there in the first verse of the 18th chapter again, that the disciples, they came to Jesus and they asked again, a question that many people ask today, who is the greatest? You know, some say Michael Jordan, some say Tom Brady, you know, some say Beyonce, but they talking about the world. Jesus, he, he began to talk about heaven. The disciples, they had a question that they thought was heavenly, but their question, it was an odd question because worldly ambitions don't belong in heaven. And so Jesus' answer to that question is the child, the one who has the spirit of a child. And so this is a season where, again, we celebrate birth, don't we? We celebrate the birth of the only begotten son of God. Do you know that with the celebration of his birth, there is much more that we can celebrate? Not just the fact that he was literally born into the world, but Jesus, he gave us something, didn't he? See, for those that don't understand my meaning by this, I want you to understand today that through the birth of Christ, Jesus has given us an opportunity at a second chance. He has given us another opportunity to get things right, to get things in order in our life. He has given us a, a chance to be renewed to where we don't have to walk like how we once did to, to where we don't have to talk like how we once did to where we don't have to act like we once did. He, he has given us an opportunity to, to be better. Not only has, has the birth of Christ given us an opportunity to be better, it has given us an opportunity to be greater. I don't know if y'all know what I mean by that. You see, I desire to be greater than I was yesterday. Than I was 10 years ago. I desire to be greater tomorrow than I am today. And thanks be to God, he, I have that opportunity. I want you to understand that through the birth of Christ, we have another birthday to celebrate. That birthday is our spiritual birth. When all of us true and sincere believers, when all of us was, was born again, are you celebrating it? All of us have a spiritual birthday, a spiritual rebirth, if you will, that, that we should live by celebrating each and every day of our spiritual lives. All those who are of sincere faith, we, I want you to understand we've been again, born again into a new life. And again, we start out this new life as, as little children. And so in this new life, I say to you today that you should hunger 
not for the food that is of this world. See how I tie back in that sermon that I preached a month or two ago? We, we should hunger. Our ambition should be for heaven, the heavenly kingdom. We should live with the mindset, as we saw in our Sunday school lesson today, a mindset where to live is Christ. A mindset that is God first, that is, that is heaven focused. The question that, that we must answer today is whether or not we have the humility, whether or not we have the willingness, whether or not we have the openness as a child to learn from the spirit in order to live in that manner. Are you a born again believer today? Do you realize that through the birth of Christ, all of us, we have become heirs. If we are of sincere faith, we have become heirs of the kingdom of heaven. John wrote in the first chapter of John's gospel and the 12th verse, as many as received him to them, he, the Lord gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. We have much again to celebrate today. In the eighth chapter of Romans, the 15th through the 17th verse, Paul wrote these words that I want you to be attentive to today. He said, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You have been given the right. I want you to understand today to be great. Don't ever let somebody tell you that you can't be great. Don't let nobody tell you that your bank account dictates whether or not you are great. You may be in poverty in the world. I don't know what your bank account is like. I know what mine is like. And so I may be in poverty according to the world, but I'm mighty rich in the eyes of God. That's all that matters to me that I am great in the eyes of God. I don't care what somebody outside of these walls have to say about me. I know who I am and I know who my savior is and I know the blessings of God and that his blessings, they have made me great. And so I urge all of you today to celebrate your spiritual birth. I urge all of you today to move as that unhindered child did when the child came to Christ. We need to move with the mindset that is heaven focused today. Where we let go of ego, we let go of selfishness, we let go of pride, we let go of stubbornness, of, of covetousness. And we move with a spirit of joy, a spirit of compassion, a spirit where we truly do care and will share and will give of ourselves to help, as Brother Harris said in the Sunday school lesson today, to help all of those that are around us. We should move again in a spirit to uplift all of those that are around us. Again, in our key verse today, Jesus said, and we'll end on this note, whoever, and I'm going to add in here, lives in the spirit of a child, whoever lives in that manner, Jesus said, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you notice there in that verse, Jesus didn't say will be. Notice the tense there. He said that is meaning that when you live in that manner, you are already the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You today, I want you to understand today, if you live with that spirit that we have talked about today, 
the spirit of a child, if you live in that manner, you are already the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let go of worldly ambition. Toss it aside. Don't let it hinder you from what God has already said about you. You are special. You are a treasure in his eyes because you are his child. So don't ever let someone hinder you from walking in the greatness that you are. Don't ever let somebody hinder you in being the special treasure you are in the eyes of God. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this sermon and that you'll be able to apply what you have watched, that you have heard, that you have listened to. Apply it to yourself and then share it with somebody somewhere. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following the Newfound Faith channel. Be sure that you're following today so that you don't miss a sermon, so that you don't miss a Sunday school lesson, a Bible study or a food for thought. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you share the Newfound Faith channel with someone somewhere.